So um, without a doubt, that is an ambitious meditation. And especially when you start resting and receiving of the present moment, really letting go continuously. Also with a sense increasingly of how whatever we're experiencing in the moment is like a quivering of the vast net of reality continuously. And we are really a local expression of everything. That's really quite something to explore and then even to open into a sense of um, timelessness, which for some begins to open into the transcendental or even for some a sense of the divine as a kind of ground for the ordinary and still amazing Big Bang universe. That's an ambitious practice. Uh, on the other hand, it's also true that in the traditional saying, the mind takes its shape on, from what it rests upon. And we can gradually, in very real ways, more and more, come to rest in our true nature, uh, which is a local expression of everything, uh, surrounded by or in the field of timelessness, in the present, the only moment that ever really is, while being whole, because we always are our whole selves continuously, usually with no necessity for getting as cranky and driven and addicted and craving and clinging as we really, as we tend to be, and also with an open heart, steadily. In other words, much as we can cultivate steadiness, lovingness, and so forth, we can cultivate the sense of timelessness, allness, nowness, wholeness, fullness, lovingness, and steadiness, in my view, which characterize the ultimate territory of human potential. Um, that's the province of, I'm really happy to show you, very cool, my new book, the cover. Uh, yay! Um, and I'm just inspired by and humbled by what's happening, you know, in the upper reaches of human potential and what we can learn from beings, my teachers and their teachers, 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 who really seem to be rested with a felt sense of spacious possibility, timelessness, while humbly and vulnerably feeling connected with everything and even supported by everything dependently in the present radically, letting go of the past, letting go of the future, even letting go of the moment as it passes on by with a strong and loving heart and self-acceptance and courageous steadiness of mind. We can learn from them and bit by bit, synapse by synapse, gradually cultivate those qualities inside ourselves. That's my sense of the highest possibilities and the coolest journey. And I think of my friends and my teachers and others who've been farther along who turn in this beckoning gesture say, come on up, the view is amazing. You know, watch out for the ice. Don't fall on your head, but keep on going. You can do it. Come on up, come on up, come on up for the sake of others as well as yourself. Anyway, so that's, that's the spirit in which I was exploring those seven practices with you. In a moment, I'll open it up for discussion and get a sense of, you know, what you experienced, in, including what did you find difficulty with, which is very understandable. It takes practice to really rest stably. And I'm guided often by this teaching from Milarepa, the great Tibetan sage living about a thousand years ago, who said, in the beginning, nothing comes. In the middle, nothing stays. By the end, nothing leaves. In other words, in the beginning, we try to uh, experience certain things and they don't come to us. And then gradually in the middle, we can do it. We can, you know, call things up. We can, with our deliberate practice, open into certain key experiences, let's say, but they don't stick around. They're not yet a trait. They're not yet automatic. They're not yet woven into the wallpaper of our own mind, right? But by the end, 
whether it's having to do with a very particular thing we're trying to develop, like a sense of self-compassion rather than harsh, destructive self-criticism, or in our journey in this life, and who knows, maybe others as well, the fulfillment of the opportunity for full awakening that's that's available for us all, and in my view, and certainly I think what the great teachers have said, you know, eventually nothing leaves. Here we are as who we are, as who we've always been. What a cool thing, right? <laughs> okay, so um, I'd like to hear what you had to say, or you know, some people certainly about the meditation and that practice. Uh, and also I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions that have to do with the structure of this meditation gathering and how we go forward online. And I've got a couple of questions for you I'm gonna to get to in a bit. But first, let me just um, scroll through the many, the many people here who are with us. And um, I want to invite anybody who'd like briefly to speak to how that meditation was for you, particularly, let's say, uh, an aspect of it that felt especially useful for you. Uh, and then maybe we'll get into aspects that felt difficult. And I'm going to tend to prioritize people who haven't spoken up very much in the past uh, in terms of who I call upon. So would anybody care to share about something that was valuable for you in the practice that you could rest in, was useful for you? Yep. Okay, Jerry, I'm going to unmute you. Excellent. Yeah, how was that for you? Um, that was that was good. Um, I had some um, images that came to mind that I wanted to share. Um, one was, um, and these were mostly in the nowness mm. part of it. Yeah. Um, I had this memory of being a child in the back seat and looking out the window and realizing that if I looked at one point um, that things would go past and it'd be, it would be all blurry and I couldn't see anything if I wasn't focusing on anything. And if I followed each thing, then I could see it like as an image. Um, so that was kind of what came to mind and thinking about how when I'm really in the nowness thing, it's sort of the same sort of thing. It's I, I'm not putting objects onto each of the sounds. Or, yeah. yeah, that's right. It's moving through you so quickly before you can conceptualize about it or thingify it or try to figure out what to do about it. Mm -hmm. So to really rest in nowness, to truly be here now, um, it's very helpful to feel resourced already with a sense of lovingness, peacefulness, and contentment, and, and not struggling with, within ourselves. That helps us, as you certainly experienced, Charlie, to really receive the freshness of the arising moment as we accept its impermanence, yeah. as we are okay with its ephemeral qualities. Mm -hmm. That's really great, yeah. And if I could just add a key point here, yeah. it's with practice that we gradually stabilize this. It's okay if it's difficult in the very beginning. Um, I think we can make the mistake of trying too hard, right? Straining, driving, I definitely am driven to a fault. I have to watch out there. On the other hand, we can make the mistake of just kind of plateauing in our personal practice and not really listening to the call of the great teachers farther up the mountain who say, okay, it's good you took a break there. Everybody needs recess sometime and keep going. As one of my key teachers, Joseph Goldstein once said to me, keep going. Okay, I wanna make room for another person then. So thank you, Geraldine. I'm gonna meet you again. Uh, maybe another person or two. I see a hand there from Courtney Hudson. That's the name I have for you. Um, Courtney Hudson, or there are two of you there. and. All right, it's your turn. Hi, thank you. Long time listener, first time caller. Um, I I really um, found a lot of power in the 
kind of riding into presence on the breath and um, then kind of rooting that into the, the compassion in, in the heart. Um, I did struggle a little bit in the later yeah. uh, stages of, of the meditation, um, but kind of, I just had like a, a really, really beautiful moment thinking about the people and the pets and all, you know, all of that love. And I, I felt like the kind of the way that you walked us through the breath and focusing um, and then anchoring onto that uh, really set me up for, for a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful time. Um, but yeah, I did struggle with the, I felt like after a little bit, I, I was like, wait, what, what am I, am I in, am I yeah. in my heart or am I in the thing or, you know, a lot of instructions, um, but definitely something I'd like to practice. Oh, that's great. Um, you know, I, I teach the, the little 40, the 45 minute thing we did. I've taught it twice as a 10 day meditation retreat. <laughs> so I just went for it this time. You know, I was like, all right, <laughs> we're going. <laughs> Awakening or bust, right? It, you know, I think there's a place for that spirit, right? Um, I remember 35 or so years ago, Sylvia Borstein, one of the key teachers at Spirit Rock Meditation Center, um, sort of galvanized the room on a Monday evening when she said, well, what about enlightenment? And there were 300 or so meditators in the room and this whole shock went through the room like, wow, you mean there's more to practice than being a little more aware and a little nicer? Yeah, now that's great. Much better than the alternative, a little more aware, a little nicer. And that's okay. As the Buddha said, this is a path that's good in the beginning, as well as it's good in the middle and it's good in the end. Still, there is that imitation without the pitfalls of straining and striving to keep on going, keep on going. And one thing I would just say, a very felt way to experience that opening into allness, I find in this comment by Mr. Rogers, one of my teachers, uh, as he a lifetime award at the Emmys, he invited everyone to feel and reflect upon who loved you into being, right? That sense of dependence upon and vulnerable receptivity to those who have loved us into being is a beautiful way to open into allness. Okay, so uh, moving on then, if that's okay, and I really appreciate what you're saying, and stay with it, it's okay, that's good, hang in there, yeah, it's great, okay. Another hand up, great, Rick. Rick Kruger, I'm gonna unmute you, great. Rick, what did you experience, how was that for you? It was incredible. <laughs> yeah. I just, um, I, you know, I've been um, trying to practice with you for a while now, maybe about a year and a half, and I'll, I'll try to make this really short. Yeah. Um, but I really, really tried to follow the uh, seven steps or stages, and, and it was um, it was relatively easy to experience each one of those uh, in a very in a different way, but also in a way that they were sort of merged with each other. So, for example, when you talk about wholeness, um, I had the sense of allness also. Yes. Yeah, I know. So, so maybe I was getting ahead of myself, right? Mm, that's right. Um, but yeah, so the, the the whole thing was just really, really powerful for me, and and I really appreciate you saying the um, sort of starting with this sense of connectedness and um, and warming the heart. Mm. And I understand. I think I really appreciate that um, that sort of resourcing. Uh, of oneself forms a kind of foundation yeah so that you you can <laughs> open up into you know nowness and yeah. and allness and, and timelessness uh, um this was almost you. like a drug experience ah. <laughs> i don't know if that's a good thing or not but um yeah thank you yeah. Uh, um what I think people experience uh, is there's kind of a cluster of in whatever words are used, right? These are just different words of pointing to ways of being, 
you know, where the mind is stable, stable present moment awareness, steadiness, with a warm heart, not a cool and indifferent heart, with a sense of emotional balance and equanimity. That kinds of clusters together. What's interesting also, and this was one of the mind blowing things that I encountered when I went into the research literature for the book, is that um, the sense of being whole, feeling rested in a sense of being rather than stressful doing in the present, everything included, with the, including the sense of the whole body and sounds as a whole, that sense of wholeness with the sense of being continuously alerted in the updating of consciousness, the arising of the present moment before conceptualization, before planning and struggling and selfing, the, the receiving of nowness, along with the sense of just a relaxed, vulnerable openness to everything. You know, the Dogen teaching, to study the way is to study the self, to study the self is to forget the self. And in the forgetting of the self, we perceive ourselves as all things, opening on into allness. Neurologically, the circuitry of that sense of feeling whole in the present with a recognition of vastness, the impersonal enormity of everything that is rippling through us locally now and now. The neurological circuitry of wholeness, nowness, and allness entwine with each other, mainly on the right side of the brain for right-handed people, mainly lower down um, as our kind of home base, our natural condition, from which as need be, sometimes we, we drift and we get stuff done or we solve crises, we put out fires and so forth. But it's really quite something to appreciate the ways in which in our own way, intuitively, wholeness, nowness, and allness can kind of coalesce and come together. Mm. So anyway, thank you, Rick. Yeah, and, thank uh, you. Yeah, maybe I'll take uh, one more person and then a little comment here. Great. Okay, anybody moving along? All right, great. Okay, I'm gonna see just a couple more. Denise, Denise, unmute Denise. Yeah, how Hello. was that for you? Yeah, thank you for years of wonderful ideas. Um, the piece that I want to remember that I heard tonight that was the new idea for me was on the breathing out, the gratitude for all life and green things. I'm not sure how much that you said and how much I just interpreted, but um, you know, I do a lot of breathing meditation, but I hadn't ever really thought before about on the exhale that there could be some loving purpose going out in gratitude for all the living, growing things that help to build this body. And um, so I think that's a really wonderful new piece for me that I want to carry. Oh, thank you very much. Um, there's this fundamental, it, it's a metaphor, but it's a feeling I call being an eddy in the stream. And to really realize that our bodies are like a standing wave in physical reality. They seem to have a stability and yet, you know, most of the atoms in our body are replaced over a few months. Certainly all the water in our body is replaced. And even atoms buried deep in our bones gradually seem to be replaced as well over multiple years. And so we really are Oh, it's like we are the universe and we are physical the universe kind of moving through us. Uh, we live because a ball of burning gas, 93 million miles away, right, has enabled the plants and the animals to, to have energy and to be who we are right now. I mean, wow, you know, like, and it, it starts conceptually. But more and more, you just, as Dogen says, you begin to perceive yourself as all things, or sometimes it's translated as to be illumin illuminated by all things, or enlightened by all things, or my personal favorite way of putting it is we start to feel lived by all things. And that's extremely useful in this time of the coronavirus and the pandemic in which understandably we, we naturally tend to withdraw, 
right? And it's so helpful to realize as well, we are buoyed by so many things. I feel so buoyed by the frontline workers. I feel buoyed by people, unsung heroes, staying at home with their kids while trying to make a living, caring for older people, restraining you know, their preferences and privileges and, and conveniences for the sake of everybody, not wanting to spread this plague you know, among the whole human tribe. Like we're buoyed by all those people. We're, we're buoyed by the profligate generosity of the universe nearly 14 billion years later. We're breathing stardust, as you know, et cetera. I mean, wow. wow. Even right. without psychedelics, as Gurdjieff yeah. said, psychedelics are like a telescope. They may show you what's possible, but then you need to walk there on your own. Anyway, thank okay. you. Okay. Did you want to say more, Denise? Oh, I was just going to say, I think we have a big feeling of inhale right now with everything that's going on. And we're not really sure when we're going to be able to exhale. And that's so it was nice to give a positive purpose to the exhale and a positive thought to carry with the exhale of now. Yeah, Thank that's you. great. Thank you very much, Denise. Bows to you. Well, in our time, let's see if there's another comment about um, you know, what you've experienced, what you found useful. I'm going to particularly call on people maybe who haven't spoken up in our gathering before. Uh, anybody care to comment? Well, oh, oh, okay. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any more. I see Cindy. I see Cindy. I'm going to unmute you, Cindy. I have to cycle through the screen, so it may take me a moment, but I see you, Cindy. Yeah. Yes, yes. First of all, I wanted to say thank you so much. It felt so good. And every week, yeah. it just feels so good to be guided by your meditation. Thank you so much. Oh, it's really my honor, and I can hardly believe I get to do it. So thank you. <laughs> I'm so glad you get to do it. <laughs> Anyway, for tonight, for me, what really was centering and felt so good was um, that right now, it's enough. It's enough. There's enough. The, the right now, I'm okay. It's okay. And I'd say I, I had to come in late, so I didn't get the first 10 minutes. So I don't know what all the seven practices are. But what I did experience, the enough really helped me settle. Like, because, yeah, it's true right now is enough, is enough. Um, the other thing too, that was really um, centering for me and really, I could really just kind of sink into was what you've been talking about was being part of that vast web, being part of the whole tapestry of life. I really could feel that connection and support. Yeah. And that also felt so good to feel that kind of, I, I focused in on something that actually is a nightmare for me and that's technology. But without the support of the people who, who do technology, we wouldn't be able to do this tonight. Yeah. And so I, I could just really settle into it. So thank you. Those mm -hmm. two things. It's enough. I feel supported and connected. So thank you. Oh, you're most welcome, Cindy. And thank you for saying all that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been reflecting lately on contentment and patience mm -hmm. as these very simple virtues and still there's something of courage in them i think of the courage to be contented right to feel that there's an enoughness and within the contentment to look around and go oh i'd like to straighten that shelf or oh there are dishes still to be done or oh there is this conflict with another person i, I really want to try to repair it and you know, there is a book to write, you know, right? <laughs> While feeling contented already. And yeah. we live in a culture that's so designed to make us chase one shiny object after another, mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, to consumerism and greed. And the Buddha talked about these three poisons of hatred and greed and delusion or ignorance. And I think that there's something really that we can experience. Like, what's it like to feel that there's an enoughness in this breath. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Literally, this breath, you could do it right now. Or to be mindful of, as the Buddha taught a lot, to be mindful of various aspects of craving, a sense of contracted, pressured discontent. Mm -hmm. Something not enough, 
something wrong. And to realize that we can deal with what is wrong out there in society or you know, problems arising in our mind, we can deal with all that without feeling frustrated, driven, or discontent, or resentful along the way. That's a key breakthrough to realize we don't need to carry that baggage along with us. He talked about the Buddha, the second darts we throw ourselves. We don't need to throw those second darts as we deal with already the first darts of life that are enough. And anyway, being mindful of the felt sense of craving decreasing mm -hmm. and the felt sense of contentment mm -hmm. increasing, which can include wholesome aims and aspirations and desires. That's a wonderful practice. And I think of it as sort of civil disobedience, cultural disobedience, to disengage from the machinery of one more shiny object after another and to have the courage to be contented. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. I think it's good actually to do my Dharma talk tonight, uh, just building off of the uh, meditation that we did and to see if anybody would care to comment further. I think I saw Shilpa with a hand up. I see Lynn Hansen. I like your last name, Lynn. Oh, and then, so Lynn, then Olivia. Okay, Lynn. So I'm going to unmute you, Lynn. All right. Yeah. Um, I think we may be related. I'm from Minnesota. <laughs> It could be my father's family runs through North Dakota. Right. That's interesting. Anyway, I, I live in a canyon and I have my windows open. And so um, it can get noisy here. And there's lots of sound that uh, is amplified because of the canyon. So as I was meditating, the idea of spaciousness and timelessness was really um, uh, forefront of my mind because I, I, I would hear music, I would hear children playing, I heard people singing happy birthday, mm. and that made me feel a real sense of the spaciousness in which I live in and that I'm all part of this whole community. And earlier today, I was reading in the backyard and there were three little sisters who make a lot of noise and they really annoy me most of the time, but uh, today I just really embraced their play and it was almost as if, as if I was transported back to being a little girl myself. Mm -hmm. And so there was this sense of timelessness. And, you know, I think I'm being probably more literal than um, what I, sh what I, where I want to go with this. I want to get to the point where I don't need all of these little props to remind me what it is like to be spacious and timeless and all that kind of thing. But that was my experience and, and your meditation really fed nicely into that and a real sense of peace with both time and space. I'm very glad for you about that. And, um, I'd like to read a quotation actually from my in my book from Mathieu Ricard, who's a Tibetan monk as well as a scientist, a biologist with a PhD. And um, it speaks exactly, Lynn, to what you were saying here. Um, in, and, and for me, the, the two truths side by side are changes and unchanging spacious stillness, right? Um, and so Mathieu Ricard says, one should learn to let thoughts arise and be freed to go as soon as they arise, instead of letting them invade one's mind. In the freshness of the present moment, the past is gone, the future is not born. And if one remains in pure mindfulness and freedom, potentially disturbing thoughts arise and go without leaving a trace. That's a practice and that's a cultivation over time that we develop and certainly a very, very useful one. So thank you, Lynn. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we have time certainly for one more person. I saw Olivia, there you are with your hand up. Okay, great, Olivia, hello. Hi, hi Rick and thank you so much for tonight. Um, I just wanted to make a brief comment about just something that was really powerful for me in that meditation, and it was the praise you used, which was how the whole universe shows up locally. And that 
it really connected me to it's really hard to put it into words actually because it was more of a felt experience uh, rather than a cognitive experience but the sense of kind of opening up and spaciousness was really profound so I just wanted to uh, thank you for using that phrase it's very powerful for me I'm really glad and you know the Buddha was full of words, as best we could tell. I mean, if you look at the surviving written record of his teachings over 40 years, there are a lot of words in there. He was quite willing, and he was clearly highly intelligent and analytic, and he, he started with words. The point, though, of the words is, just like you described, Olivia, is to have the feeling of it. So I use different kinds of words, and they come from my own background. Other people will use other words. That's great. Um, but we really can start with kind of a knowing that we really are the universe operating locally. And then more and more, we start to feel it. We realize that every wave in the ocean, every, you know, there's only one ocean really wrapping around our whole planet. Every wave in that moment is the expression of all the causes coalescing there now. And to realize that each of us is the universe quivering locally. You know, it's, it's as if I, I, we're like some sort of gauzy surface flapping in the breeze as the universe waves through us as us. Wow. You know, that's pretty great. Um, okay, good. That's, that's, that's good. Um, maybe, so thank you, Olivia. I really appreciate that. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I'll, I'll just say a little differently. You know, each of us, is a patterning, in effect, we are a, a local patterning of allness of the fit of the universe that we're in. We're a local patterning of allness, and allness, the unfolding of the universe, um, quite possibly, and in my experience and view, quite actually, is flowing through the banks of timelessness. So we are a patterning of allness, a rippling of allness, transient, we have our time, and then we will disperse into the allness that has been the ground all along. Wow. Being accessible to timelessness and the infinite, like that's our possibility. Uh, I think is the invitation of the great teachers and what we can increasingly establish and inhabit in our own lives, so. Thank you. Okay, so I'd, I'd like to finish up here with a bit of a question for you all. Uh, two questions, really. They're, they're practical ones. So um, some have asked for shorter meditation and longer opportunities for a talk from me and um, questions and, and interaction with each other. So we're balancing multiple considerations here. And I just want to get, if I could, kind of a quick read of whether, how you would feel about a half hour meditation, right? I'm seeing that some people really like a longer meditation. So I'm wondering how you would feel about a shorter meditation, but more opportunity for discussion. So I'm seeing hands waving. Sorry, we can't, I can't unmute you, then it'll be total chaos. Um, how do you feel about a half hour meditation with more time for presentation, Dharma talk and discussion? Of course, you all are the hardcore meditators who've stuck it out. Um, <laughs> all right, yeah, why don't you, if you could tell you what, we'll do this with chats, okay? I, I see thumbs down, I, I caught that, Peter, that was good, that was very vivid, uh, it was great. Um, Put it into the chat, if you could, your own personal opinion. If you had to choose, because you know we, we want to try to stay within the 90 minute frame so it's accessible for people, and then we'll sort it out. I'll just kind of respond to it all. The other is, uh, question is whether to regulate uh, comments and questions entirely through chat or to do what I've been doing, which is to call on people in a good old fashioned way if you raise your hand, which is imperfect. Sorry, Shilpa, I left you out this time. Um, or we could just do it entirely through chat. 
which would require people to keyboard in their question or comment if they have one. And then I would just sort of review them and see them and summarize them and so forth. So, okay, tell you what, please put your votes on those two questions, 30 minute meditation or say 45. Uh, and if we do a shorter meditation, we'd have more time for presentation and questions and discussion, which can be very rich. Um, and also second, do you prefer uh, that I do what I'm doing currently with um, taking questions from those people who wanna get their voice in the room, you know, and try to obviously ask people to speak to the topic at hand and to be succinct about that. And then I respond to their voice versus just doing it all through chat. Okay, all right, good. So in a moment, I'm gonna unmute you. And before we do that, I'd like and give you all a chance to sort of say hello and goodbye to each other on the way out the door. I'd also like you to know that we are really figuring out how to arrange for small groups of form uh, for those who want immediately after this main meeting. I see Jed's thumb up and other people's thumbs up. Um, this can be done in Zoom. It's easy to do. We'll, we'll kind of sort out the mechanics of it. We'll enable people who don't want to do it to exit, no problem. Um, and then, but for those who want, as I myself will exit, but you can stick around for 20 minutes, let's say, typically organized around a, a suggested question or topic to explore with each other. Uh, and then you'll do whatever you do courteously, I hope, uh, you know, and then you'll have that opportunity to interact with others. So we will set that up. We will really set that up. All right. Okay, good. So as we close here, I wanna thank you for being so gracious uh, with me as I go after this quite ambitious meditation, these seven ways of being, of steadiness, lovingness, fullness, wholeness, nowness, allness, and timelessness. Thank you really for that. Uh, and also I wanna express my gratitude that you're showing up. This is really appreciated. And I'd like to, close just before I unmute everyone and we can say goodbye to each other uh, with a quotation that starts off my book. It's at the front page. And it's a quotation I think about from the Buddha Dharma a lot. It summarizes so many things that I think are really important. Here we go. Train yourself in doing good that lasts and brings happiness. Every word counts. Train yourself in doing good that lasts and brings happiness inside your own mind, as well as in relationships and out in the world. Train yourself in doing good that lasts and brings happiness. Cultivate generosity, the life of peace, and a mind of boundless love.